All right, we're continuing our series in Elijah the Tishbite. And whatever a Tishbite is, we don't really know. <laughs> but uh, the title of the message this afternoon is The God of Elijah, which, you know, emphasis on the, you know, the God of Elijah. Look at, you're in uh, 1 Kings 18, look at, uh, well, you are, I'm not. 1 Kings 18, look at verse 17. 1 Kings 18, <clears throat> verse 17 says, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou in thy father's house, uh, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. You remember he, he kind of starts this off calling it, uh, Elijah a troublemaker. And Elijah says, no, I'm not the troublemaker. You're the troublemaker because you went after all these ways. But now look at verse 30, 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And so uh, this is the idea that they're talking about the God of Elijah throughout the story and other places he's called that. And so this idea is the false prophets had these false gods that they were worshiping and they were calling these gods the true gods. And of course, we know that that wasn't the case. Elijah was, was super confident that that wasn't the case. Everybody except for Ahab and the false prophets uh, you know, they they were depending on these false gods. And so uh, the, the claim at the end of this great uh, contest, if you will, was that they all worship the God. He is the God was the idea there. All right, so number one, I want to talk about the, uh, the God of Elijah, of course, which we understand is the same God that we worship today. And so as we look at the God of Elijah from this chapter, we're going to compare that to the God of that we serve and worship today. Okay, number one, the God of Elijah is never outnumbered. He's never outnumbered. Look at verse 19 again. Uh, let's see. Verse 19 says, Now therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So these false prophets that he's gathering together, you know, there's 450 and then there's 400. So 850 against one, Elijah. Of course, we know there are others that had not bowed the knee to Baal, but Elijah, from his perspective, he's like, I'm the only one. I'm the only one serving God and I'm outnumbered by all of these hundreds and hundreds of false prophets, you know, who are worshiping this other God. Doesn't stop Elijah. He knows he worships the true God. And God's never outnumbered. I think about uh, this, uh, uh, the story of Gideon, something I, I think about that quite a bit because the power of God through the life of, of Gideon and the army that he raised up of, of only just got it down all the way to like 300. And by that, they were able to defeat a large army. But here's what God says. Let's go there to Judges 19. No, Judges 7, sorry. Judges 7. And this is where we read the story of Gideon. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched besides the well, beside the well of Herod, <clears throat> so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. God literally wanted them to have less people, and, you know, to be weak in their own eyes and to be few in their own eyes so that he could do great things. And he looked at their army and said, No, 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 that's too many. When you, when you fight this battle, you're going to say, Look what we did. Look what we accomplished. And he said, No, no, no. I want to get this down so that God, so that I get the glory, is what he says. Verse 3, Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. 
what, all the way down to 10,000? How can we fight this war with 10,000 people against a great army? You know, but then God says in verse 4, the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And, if, uh, and it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This uh, shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth water, uh, lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. I've heard people explain this, and I don't really know all, exactly what's going on here, but I've heard people explain this where they says, well, some of them went down and they brought the water up to their hand, lapping it like a dog, and it was like they were cautious and they were aware and they were looking, you know. And so these were soldiers that you wanted to use. And the other ones, they just jumped down and put their head in the water, and they showed that they weren't, you know, they, they, they weren't... Uh, uh, temperate, you know what I mean? They were just like, just, you know, oh man, I need the water. And those guys aren't worthy. And so he cast them out. But really, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because the purpose that God is, what he's trying to accomplish here is to show you're nothing, right? I'm going to win this battle my own self. I'm not, it's not like, hey, we're going to show you because really that would be bragging too. Like these 300, look how mighty these 300 were. He picked the best of the best and they were so wise and they were so... That's really not the point. So like, however you want to break down what exactly was going on and how they did that, because I'm sure there are some legitimate applications that can be made, but none of that really matters. What matters is God got them down to nothing. You know what I mean? And I've heard other people say the opposite, like, you know, they were scared and that's why they were doing that. Cause they're, you know, like, it doesn't matter. The point of the story is God said, all right, we're going to put this, the people that do this to the side, people that do this to the side. And we're only going to keep this one group of people. And it gets down to 300. Look at verse seven. The Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. And so the story is that God gets the victory. All the people in the surrounding communities look upon the God of Gideon and they fear the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And, uh, and this is the way it is. Joshua, you know, they go into war and they go into the, to, to Canaan land, you know, and what is, people are terrified because of the things God had done, not because of Joshua or his army, but the things that God had done. And there's many stories like that where, where they, they fight the battle on their own. How would you like that? You're, you're kind of scared. Anybody would be kind of nervous going into a battle, I'm sure. But you're kind of scared and you're getting ready to do the battle. And all of a sudden these men pull out their swords and start killing each other. And you didn't even have to do anything in the war. They're just killing each other because God blinded their eyes and caused them to do uh, such a thing. The thing is, God, you can't be outnumbered. It doesn't matter how many you throw into the battle, you know, if they're going up against God. In the end, he's going to prove himself victorious. And so if we're Christians, you know, like Elijah, and we feel all alone and we feel like, oh, man, the God that I worship just doesn't seem to be the popular one. It doesn't seem like anybody's listening to me as I'm preaching about him or whatever. Well, stand alone in the faith of God and say, you know what? God's not outnumbered. I'm not worried about how few people, you know, listen to me or have to or worry about what I say. But God himself is going to end up being uh, showing himself true in the end. He shows himself very strong among the few and the weak. This is what God always shows. He wants to be glorified in the people that are weak and the people that are, uh, you know, a, a few. He wants to be given the glory and he will be given the glory. Number two, the God of Elijah, uh, I said he's never outnumbered. Go back to 1 Kings 18. Number two, the God of Elijah answers prayer. The God of Elijah answers prayer. Now, this is important because we say, wait a minute, he's got all the power to do whatever he wants to do. You know, this is kind of like the Calvinistic idea that, that people get that says, you know, well, whatever God's going to do, he's going to do. Like, it's all his power. And they, they really will say, like, if, if you have free will and you could do something that's, that goes against God's will, that would make you more powerful than God. So obviously, you know, that's the reasoning. So obviously you don't have free will. Anything that happens is because God wanted it to happen and all that, which, which gets into all these kind of weird ideas. But the thing is, God's always 
uh, decided to use men and to use their free will to bring about whatever he's going to do. And it's hard for us to understand how that works, but it doesn't. That's, that's how powerful of a God he is. But he answers prayer. And so I've thought this in my own life many times, like God already knows what I'm going to pray for before I even pray it. So why do I even have to pray it? Well, because he told you to <laughs> bring your, you know, make supplication for others and bring your peti your petitions and your requests, make them known unto him and, and, and go before him and pray. And that's what he's going to bless, you know, your faith and then stepping out in faith and praying to him. And he says, all right, I'm going to bless that, you know, in a manner of speaking, that's salvation, isn't it? And our faith, people are like, well, I just don't know what's going to happen. How do you know if somebody believed or not? Look, here's how I know. They say, you know, I believe that, and I want to pray and receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. So they say a prayer. Now, not everybody says a, a prayer. It's not the exact prayer. It's a, but that's not the point. The point is that they call out to God. They put their trust in them, and then they have to do something. Oh, that's a work salvation. No, here's the work of God that you believe, right? So there is a work, but it's a work that's just belief in Him. Well, how could we believe? I've heard people use this argument, like, you know, you can't make somebody believe. They either believe or they don't believe. That's not true. You can choose to believe something. And that has to be true because God wants you to choose to believe in Him. And so if you believe in Him and by faith you receive, He'll save you. And so this is kind of how God works. The same is true when, uh, you know, ev evangelism. You know, how many of you ever heard? Well, what about the people on the other side of the world who've never heard the gospel? Well, first of all, you don't know that they've never heard the gospel. You don't know that somebody's not in their villages preaching the gospel to them or, or however God might have sent somebody there. But here's the point. We know that God sends preachers to preach the gospel. And so you're like, well, why can't God just, why wouldn't he just save them? Why not give them a vision? Why not get, you know, uh, because he decided I'm going to use mankind. I'm going to use my people that have faith in me and who believe me, and I'm going to send them out to go do something. And so sometimes, think about this. I mean, hey, think about this. Let's say somebody in this church, I'm not putting blame on anybody, okay, but I'm saying let's somebody, say somebody in this church is sick. And the only, thing, the only thing keeping them from getting better is that you haven't asked God, hey, would you heal that, would you heal that person, right? And you never do that, and so the person's sick, right? What if that's the case? What if we had that power to just pray, ask God to heal somebody, and he would heal them? Now, I've preached messages on the charismatic movement and the spiritual empowerment and stuff like that, and I understand the fallacy there. I understand that the sign gifts are no longer a thing. But we are supposed to go to God. We can read in James and see that we're supposed to go to him and pray for the afflicted, you know, the sick. Perhaps somebody is living in sin, and so God's punishing them, and he's waiting for a man of God to say, God, forgive this guy of his sins, you know, and, and, and let's restore him back to, you know. And so he prays for him and he, and he labors for that. How many times, my, the point that I'm trying to make, there's something not happening. You're just like, well, God didn't allow it to happen. It just wasn't his will. And the truth is we never prayed for it. We never asked God that he would intervene. We never asked him, you know, for, uh, and made our petitions known. Uh, it's certainly possible, but Elijah uh, had to pray. God wanted him to pray. Isn't that an interesting thing? Like, uh, we'll, we'll get to this here in a minute, but God actually, all the things that, that, that Elijah prays, like, God, shut up the heavens and don't let rain to come anymore. What we understand as we read scripture is that God told him to pray that. <laughs> and so you think like he just, he was just telling God what to do. Well, only because God wanted him to pray that. And so he, by faith, was praying that God would do that in the, in the presence of, of Ahab. It's an interesting thing to consider, but God uses man. But here's the thing. He wants us to make our predictions known. He wants us to ask him for things. And then he grants them because it really shows how great of a God he is, that he answers prayer. Now, let's compare that to the false prophets and their gods. Look at uh, verse 26. 1 Kings 18, verse 26. All right, so you know the story here. Elijah says, all right, let's, let's, we're going to basically have a contest here. This is something I wouldn't encourage anybody to do, all right? But God uh, wanted him to do this. And so he's, we're, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to prepare our sacrifices, and then we're going to ask God to consume the, the fire. No, but we're not going to put fire on it ourselves. We're going to consume the sacrifice with fire. But God's going to send the fire down. And so you go first. If your God sends it down, he's the God. If my God sends down fire and consumes fire, then he's the God. 
in the province of Baal, surprisingly, are like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> they must really believe, you know, uh, some of them at least, uh, believe that it's going to happen. And that's unfortunate. There are a lot of people that are going to die and go to hell trusting in a false god. And they truly have put their faith in that god. They truly, like nothing you can do to convince them that that god's not real. They see it in their mind that he is real. And some people say, well, that's not fair. You know, they, they can't help it. They were born in that way or whatever. No, you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ and, and the God of the Bible, uh, or else you're not going to uh, uh, be, you're not going to please God. You're certainly not going to be saved, and you're not going to be able to live for Him if you're not doing that. All right, so uh, here's what it says verse 26 And they took the bullock, this is the prophets of Baal, which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. And I, it doesn't say what else they were saying, but I don't know if it's repetitious. I mean, obviously, false God, uh, false religions, a lot of times, vain repetition, right? So maybe they were thinking, well, Baal will hear us if we just say it enough times. You know, oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Can you imagine hearing that all night long, right? Uh, and then they says, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. So they had made this little altar where they're going to do the sacrifice. And now they're like leaping on it, <laughs> you know, throwing themselves on the altar. Oh, Baal, hear us. They leaped on the altar, which was made, and it came to pass at noon. I just love this part. I can't help. Maybe I'm in the flesh whenever I enjoy it. But Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's talking or he's pursuing or, or uh, uh, he is in a journey or peradventure he sleepeth. And must be awaked. <laughs> I just love it. Here's a one man all by himself, and he's against the king and the king's prophets, uh, uh, false prophets, you know, 850 of them, maybe other spectators. I don't know how many people are there. And there's one guy, and he's like, ha ha. <laughs> Try a little bit louder. <clears throat> Gotta wake up your God. In Japan, when we went into Japan, they actually have what they call happy gods, right? And each temple, I think, had their own happy god. Uh, I think I think happy God's the right way to say it. And they would ring that bell, dong, 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 to wake up their God. And I remember we were newly Christian. We actually got saved in Japan. And we would go after we were saved and we'd realize they're trying to wake up their God. Isn't that something? <laughs> dong, dong, maybe we'll wake him up. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, but this is how people are because they don't understand why their God's not answering. Well, we as Christians should never have to worry about that because our God's always listening and He answers prayer. Uh, so anyway, God is in the business of answering prayer. We don't have to make a spectacle of ourselves in order for Him to hear us. Okay, I mentioned charismatic movement and here's a good example. You know, sometimes they want to do something super elaborate and super like, you know, we're just really going to prove. Now, what Elijah does here is pretty, is pretty uh, you know, sensational. There's no doubt about that. But he doesn't have to go up there, and God's not requiring anybody to cut themselves. You know, all right, God, you know, please. I mean, it makes me think of, uh, you know, there's the charismatics that have these, like, a lot of things that they want to do to kind of get God to hear them. And, and uh, you know, there's this, obviously, the false prophets are the ones that are encouraging it. But, like, the more money you give... To this work, the more God's likely to answer you. They, they flat out say that. Like the more you give, the seed gift that you, the bigger it is, the bigger your blessings are going to be or whatever. And they, they're trying to make people think like, oh man, I have to really impress God by giving more and, and giving more. But no, God just simply wants you to come to him in faith and ask him for whatever it is uh, that you're needing. You know, if you're if you're a righteous man, the, righteous, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you're a righteous man, then you want what God wants, and you're going to go to him. He's going to give it to you. You understand? It's not just like an open thing, just whatever prayer I ask, if I believe enough, he's going to give it to me. Not if he doesn't want you to have that. You understand? It has to be you're asking according to God's will. Okay, we'll look at some verses about that in a minute. But uh, but he's never too... He, he, you don't have to make a spectacle of yourself. You don't have to cut yourself or cry aloud or jump up and down on the altar or, or jump in the baptistry or whatever kind of crazy stuff. You've seen people do some weird stuff, right? You don't have to do that. Uh, also makes me think about the zealots, you know, that whip themselves and all in the monasteries like the Catholic or uh, I don't know what uh, other uh, 
you know, like the Orthodox or whatever, where they just really have to, you know, put themselves in a situation where they're suffering so bad. And if I suffer enough, then God will listen to me. You know, it's, it's, it's not like that. You just have to. Now, sometimes he's going to put you through some suffering. But what he wants us to do is just come to him simply asking for what it is uh, that, that we're needing for, uh, according to his will. All right. Now, uh, God is also obviously like the Baal, you know, hey, maybe he's sleeping. God's never sleeping. You know, we understand a few things about God and, and we, we understand, you know, I'm not for systematic theology where you just write this book, you know, according to your own ideas about who God is. Uh, there's a lot of those books out there. But here's some things we know about God that are in the Bible about his personality. But then there's also some things that we just kind of understand. Uh, this kind of has to be you can you can prove it from the Bible, but it's like it has to be. There has to be a God who's eternal. I mean, I mean, I don't care if you don't believe in the Bible. It, it, I don't care if you call yourself an atheist and you believe evolution and we all got here by, you know, just process, you know, of uh, the Big Bang and then uh, survival of the fittest, all that kind of stuff. You have to admit that something was eternal. And they will admit that. They'll admit, oh, well, there's something existed, a force, you know, uh, some matter, you know, some energy. Uh, you know, there was something that existed. Yeah, that's right. It's God. <laughs> Something existed for eternity. We also know that whatever that is that existed has to be a pretty powerful force, doesn't it? I mean, it has to be something that has unlimited power, you know, so that so that it could be able to accomplish the, the things that happen. And we understand it's God. God uh, has unlimited power. Let me use a few uh, kind of theological words that we use sometimes. Uh, some of them are in the Bible, so we're going to look at those. Uh, I'm not just making up these silly terms. One is... And this isn't a word that's in the Bible, but you understand what it means. Omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Now, that's hard to understand because we think, and sometimes people talk about the Trinity and they get in their mind like three beings, like, like almost like three gods, you know, and that's not how it works. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain the Trinity right now, but, but here's what we know about God. And by the way, when I say God, that's God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. All three of those in some way or another are, are omnipresent everywhere at the same time. You can't go anywhere. Jesus isn't there. You can't go over here and be like, oh, the Holy Spirit's here, but Jesus isn't here because Jesus is in heaven. No, Jesus is everywhere. What about God the Father? You know, uh, his, Maybe he's dwelling in the temple right now in heaven, and it's only his spirit that's wandering around. No, God the Father is omnipresent. They're all omnipresent. They share the attributes because they're one. All right. I hope that makes sense, and I'm not, I'm not confusing anybody on that. But, uh, but here is what the Bible says about God in being uh, omnipresent everywhere at the same time. Best... Probably verse to look up is Psalm 139. And there's a whole bunch we could go to, but Psalm 139. And look at verse 8. Psalm 139, verse 8 says, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art, here, thou art there. See, there's nowhere you can go. You can't go in the depths of the sea to hide from God. You can't go into your closet and hide from God. You can't go, you know, there's nowhere you go. Maybe if I get up high, maybe if I go into outer space, you know. I was, I was going to say, no, then you're even closer to God. But that's not, <laughs> no matter where you go, you're closer to God. It's not like, well, I'm... You know, this person went to hell, and so he's like, you know, only Satan there. He's not in God's presence. No, he's being punished and tormented in God's presence, the Bible talks about. He's, there's nowhere you can go where God's not present, okay? And this is hard for us to fathom, but it has to be true. It has to be true. I mean, I mean it's biblical, but beyond that, just that there would be a God. It has to be a God who understands everything uh, at the same time. Okay, so... Uh, so he's omnipre omnipresent. Another word uh, that's you, that we use is omniscient. Okay, meaning not only is he everywhere at the same time, but he knows all things. I keep getting those two mixed up. Romans 16, 27 says this, To God only wise be glory uh, through Jesus Christ forever. A God who not only can be everywhere at the same time, but can also understand everything that's going on at the same time. So when you start reading in the Bible and you're just like, Oh, man, I'm really confused about predestination and the foreknowledge of God and all that. Look, you're going to be confused because you can't comprehend all things at the same time. God, however, can in his foreknowledge know what's going to happen and then still give people free will 
to make their own choices. And then it happens according to, you know, according to his, the, the end result, according to his will. Like, I don't understand. I don't understand because it would think about this. If someone has free will, it's constantly changing because your choices are going to affect, you know, the outcome of a situation. And yet God already knows what you're going to choose. He didn't predestinate it in that way, but he did predestinate that all those who come to Christ will be conformed to the image of his son. I mean, he, he's got some a tr set of trials that he's determined to put you through because he knew from the foundations of the world that you're going to be saved. Look, I'm not saying this is an easy doctrine to understand, but it's something that the Bible talks about. He, uh, he is omniscient. He knows all things. Now you say, well, well, there were some things that Jesus didn't know whenever he was on the earth, right? I don't understand that. I just know he took on the form of a man. And so there were some limitations that, uh, that, that man, Jesus Christ on this earth uh, uh, had as far as knowing, you know, the timing of certain things or whatever. Uh, but even Jesus on the earth in a man's body, there was still, it seemed like unlimited knowledge. People would be thinking something and he knew what they were thinking or he, he understood the, the hearts of mankind uh, because he was not just man, but he was also God. And so some of this is hard to understand, I know, but the, this is what we're talking about, an amazing God. You know, the gods of this world, the gods that, you know, for instance, Elijah's laughing about, you know, the absurdity that there would be a God that you have to wake up. The absurdity that there would be a God that that won't answer unless you cut yourself, you know, <laughs> or won't, you know, there's uh, these these are some weird ideas. But the Bible talks about a God, the only God, the God, and and there's only one God. And so uh, and so this is what we're talking about. Revelation 19. Look at this. There's another word that is here in the Bible. It's a it's a theological word, but we find, we actually find it here, and that's omnipotent. So not only is he everywhere present, uh, omniscient, which means he's all-knowing, but he's also omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. Well, if he's all-powerful, could God ever make a rock that he couldn't lift? <laughs> Anybody ever heard that? <laughs> Don't get caught up in those kind of weird things. Look, he's all-powerful. That's all we know. <clears throat> Some of you all are going to be thinking about that now the rest of the message. Revel <laughs> Revelation chapter 19, look at verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of many uh, of mighty thundering, saying, "Alleluia, for the law, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth." Uh, that word "omnipotent" means he's all powerful. He's all, he's all potent, right? He can do whatever. He he has unlimited power. There's nothing that he can't do. Uh, okay. Now you can say, well, he can't lie or whatever. Like these are, there are attributes about him that he, because of his character, he will never do, but he has unlimited power. Okay. This is the basic idea. All right. So number one, the God of Elijah, the God of Elijah is never outnumbered. The God of Elijah answers prayers. Number three, the God of Elijah isn't impressed by your works that are pleasing to man. Right? Every work that we do that we're like, oh, that's a good work for the Lord. Well, actually, what you mean by that is that's a good work in the eyes of man for the Lord. You know what I mean? Like, like man, the whole world is going to see that work and say, oh, well, this is a this is a mighty man. All the works that he's doing for, for God. Right. But what we want to know is, well, what impresses God? Not what impresses man that makes me look like I'm impressing God by my works. <laughs> Did I lose anybody there? Uh, it's very, there's a big difference. What man sees as good works and what God sees as good works. Uh, of course, God, uh, you know, expects perfection and we all come short of that. But God uh, uh, is not impressed with the works that are pleasing to man. And let me show you what I mean by that. Look at verse 33 back in, our, in 1 Kings 18, verse 33. All right, so after all this cutting themselves and throwing themselves on the altar and, and uh, saying, oh, Baal, hear us for hours upon hours upon hours. Now it's Elijah's turn. Okay, let's look how Elijah does this. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, okay, now he's telling the spectators or the prophets or whoever. He said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Now, if you were standing around there and he said that, you'd be like, well, that's a dumb idea. Like, really, how is, how is your sacrifice going to catch on fire if you pour water on it? Like, that's a dumb idea. And he said, do it a second time. 
and they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran round about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in, uh, thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Okay, I'll get to that part here in a minute. But here's the thing. We don't need to reach people by what they think is the right way to do it. Does that make sense? We don't have to go out and have a survey in the, in the neighborhood, right? We go around in the community with a little survey like, hey, we're starting a church over here on 75th Street. And we just want to know, like, what do you, what would bring you into the house of God? What do you think would be a good way for us to have church? I mean, th this is how churches today are building their churches. All right, they are actually having surveys, uh, secret shoppers. I don't know if they're still doing that, but it was a trend for a while. They would pay somebody online to come sit in a service, and at the end, they fill out this questionnaire and tell them, like, you know, what they could do better, you know, to be a good to be a good church. And so the idea is, hey, what does pe what do people want? We want to get them in here. So so what kind of church do they want? You know, what works for them? Look, nobody would ever say, you know, I just pour, why don't you pour some cold water on that that sacrifice, and then maybe it's more likely to catch on fire. You know, nobody would think about that. But this is what uh, this is what God's doing. We don't need to find gimmicks to get people into church and to see the Lord. You know, work done better. You, know, you start going out here thinking, well. What ways can we, you know, would be more effective in getting the gospel to people? Well, it doesn't matter. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. I mean, that's, that's, that's what he wants us to do. Well, I just don't think that's effective anymore. That's what some preachers will say. I just don't think that's effective anymore. What you need to do is you need to get these bands in and you got to get all this kind of stuff and you got to invite people in the community. And if you get enough people there, then, then, you, then you have time to preach to them and then they get saved. Look, that's not what Jesus said to do. Jesus said, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. Right? Old-fashioned soul winning, <laughs> two by two, you know, go into the world, knock on every household, give them the opportunity to hear the, hear the gospel. This is a biblical idea. But the world says, that doesn't work anymore. You know, that's just, you're never going to catch on fire, you know, for the Lord doing something like that. Well, guess what? It's not about me. You know, Elijah said, pour water on that sacrifice. Nobody would have thought that would work but he just did it God's way. We don't have to look for gimmicks. Now, I did preach a message here not too long ago that talked about uh, niche, niche ministries, okay? But I hope you understood the point of that message. It wasn't like, hey, we need to go out and come up with this niche. No, in fact, it was the opposite. It was like, don't do that. But at the same time, God's going to find something. God's going to put you into something. You know, something's going to happen that's going to define who you are. That's just how churches, churches go. And you can go through different ministries. And we talked about the fishers of men and how he chose some fishermen and all that stuff. We could go through the Bible and find lots of different ministries that had a little niche to it. You know, uh, some of the people that the Apostle Paul worked with were tent makers. You know, that was their little niche or whatever. That was the point of that message. But the idea is if we try to craft something, you know, and, 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 and do it upon ourselves, well, we're doing exactly the opposite of what God wanted whenever he called Gideon. You know, and it said, hey, no, I want to just get this down to 300 people at the most, you know, and then I will be able to show you that it was me. It wasn't you. That's important for us to, as Christians and as a church to remember. Look, we're not interested in doing it the way people want us to do it or doing it in the way that seems the most effective. We want to do it God's way. And I remember uh, uh, the story of, of uh, Gideon just really being on my mind when I took over the pastor at, at Iola because we had gone down to a very small congregation that most people would say, it's not going to make it, not going to survive. We had got down not only to a small congregation, but they were all in their 70s and 80s. I'm not, that's not no exaggeration. That's common in independent Baptist churches, by the way. There's a lot of small independent Baptist churches that have all older folks, you know, and there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, and there's a lot of reasons I could attribute to why Iola's that way. But here's what I know for sure. Uh, it got down to that by the time I was a pastor. It got down to that. Now, a lot of people had left right before I became the pastor. There's, there's a lot of story, inside stories. You don't have to know all the gossip, right? But it got down to that. And I, and I remember people saying, like, eh, it's not looking. I had a guest pre preacher one time. I think it was a missionary. He came in, and afterwards he was like, well, I just want to. Sometimes people want advice or whatever, so I just want to give you some advice. I'm like, oh, absolutely. Give me some advice. And he's like, you know, he basically said, like, the people, the, the, what you got going on here, statistically, it's not going to last, because, you know, you, all you've got are 
just old for you. You really got to get the young people in. And he was trying to give me a career. He wasn't trying to be, a, you know, he, he wasn't trying to be the guy that I'm talking about, but he kind of was. He was saying, well, you got to figure out what works and you got to do this and you got to do that. And I'm thinking in my head, you know, if I can figure something like that out and then it gets successful, right? I'm at the end of the day going to be like, look at the work that I built. Look at the work that I built, man. I really am a wise guy. Like I really am a knowledgeable, you know, I just know how to get people and I know how to do things. That would be the worst thing for me. I'm just going to tell you that right now. <laughs> that would really, I already got a big head. That would. <laughs> so here's what God does to me on a regular basis. He humbles me, right? And all the things that I think that I'm going to do, I'm like, hey, this would be a great idea. It doesn't work. Every time I preach a message and I'm like, man, I hope so-and-so is going to be there. Now, this I'm not talking about Brother Justin, okay? I didn't have him in mind. <laughs> but seriously, this happens a lot. Somebody, I'm like, I hope so-and-so is there, man, because they're, this message is really going to change their life. Guess what? They don't show up. <laughs> All I have to do is just say, Lord, what do you want me to preach? I'm going to preach it. You know, I'm going to do the best of my ability. I can only study for so many hours, you know, and come up with a message. But you need to use that. And you need to, you need to, you know, let it do what it needs to do. All I can do is say, Lord, send us laborers. We're knocking on doors. You know, we're not seeing a whole lot. I'm talking about Iola specifically. We're not seeing a whole lot of growth just from knocking on doors, but we want to go give the gospel. That's what you told us to do. But we need laborers. Lord, send us some laborers. Lo and behold, however many years later, this Kansas City work. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. I can't hardly take anybody that's in here or anybody that's not here but should be here and say, uh, you know, man, it's because I just went to their door and I discipled them and I got them going. No, nope, somebody else did it in almost every case. A lot of it was from preaching online. A lot of people came here, you know, from listening to the same kind of preaching or whatever. Some people were guys that you guys went out and won to the Lord, and then they started coming to church, you know, got baptized or whatever. Look, I'm not, I'm the pastor here. God's called me to lead this, this work, but it's not me, man. I, I, I don't have any power. What we need to do is say, God, I just want you to, you know what I mean? If God says, hey, Oh, here's what you need to do. You need to go ahead and pour cold water on this thing, right? Now, I'm going to tell you this. We live in 2021. You are hard, it is getting harder and harder to find churches that use the King James Bible. It is. It's getting really hard because people are like, ah, we don't understand that anymore. Well, guess what? Worked for 400 years. God blessed it for 400 years for the English-speaking people. And so you say, no, no, no. But if you really want to grow this thing, you got to start speaking their language and you got to go with the Bibles that are, you know, the, the hot items on the shelf right now and the NIV and the ESV. And you got, you got to get those or else it's not going to work, right? No, I think I'll just go ahead and pour the cold water. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you got to get some more song, some better songs in here, man. The, those hymns. You got that old hymnal. You're singing these songs. People don't even know how to sing those. I don't even know how to read music or, or follow the line. They're just looking like, I don't know what to do. You know, no, nope, we're going to just keep on singing them. And I know you can't find that necessarily in the Bible, but I'm saying just an old thing that, that the world would be like, ah, oh, that doesn't work, you know. But here's the thing. We're just going to do it. We're just going to do it because that's what God's called us to do. And, and that's what God's put on our hearts. And that's what we're, that's what we're doing. And we're going to let him get the glory for it in the end. It's not like, man, that was pretty good thinking what you had to sing out of the hymns and read out of the King James Bible because you had this, you found this little niche of people. No, that's not what we're looking for. We're just looking for doing it God's way, impressing God. He's our audience. He's our, the one that we're trying to impress. And, and, uh, and at the end of the day, we're just going to pray to him. We're just going to leave it in hands. We're going to say, Lord, what do you want us to do? At the end of the day, he's the one that's going to get the glory for it all. God seems, you ever notice, he just kind of seems like he uh, loves just simple obedience and humility. Like, like you know, he doesn't, he's not really, he doesn't impress by all this spectacular stuff. He's just pretty simple in the way that he, uh, he just, I just want you to simply just obey. <clears throat> Look at verse 36. You say, I don't know, this is pretty, this is a pretty radical thing that Elijah did. I mean, he must have came up with this challenge and come up with, hey, here's what we'll do, God. We'll, I'll, pour, I'll have him pour water on the sacrifice, you know, or, or we'll, we'll, we'll decide to have this, this, uh, this showdown. And we'll have the sacrifices and we'll pour water on the sacrifice. And then you can call it on fire from heaven and just really impress them. Here's the thing. None of this was Elijah's idea. Look at verse 36. 
And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Sounds to me like that's what he was supposed to be doing anyway, bringing the sacrifices to, uh, to the temple that, uh, or, or to the mountain. That Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, look at his humble prayer. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He didn't say, Lord God of the great Elijah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the other guy said, you know, about the God of Elijah, you know, in other later chapters and stuff. He said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Everything he did was what God told him to do. So at the end of the day, if they're like, man. Elijah, such a man of God. Now, he was a man of God. He was a righteous man. And, the, and we, we read this uh, later in the Bible that the, the, in James, that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Right? And they use Elijah as an illustration because he prayed and, 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 rain, and, and he shut up the rain. And then later on he prays and the rain comes down. But look, he was only doing what God had told him to do. And he had to exhibit a lot of faith too because even though he's following God and he's telling him to do this, it's like, well, I don't know. <laughs> Is this really going to happen? Let me show you what I mean. Look at uh, verse 42. So, uh, or in Eli- 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. I don't think he was really saying, You hear it? You hear that sound? The rain's coming. No, he's just by faith saying, God has said, Now the rain's going to come. And Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said unto his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and he looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again. (laughs) The guy comes back. He's like, Sorry to tell you this, Elijah, but there's no rain coming. Go back again. Second time he goes. Comes back. Nope, still nothing. Third time fourth time, fifth time. You think maybe even Elijah was kind of like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, I'm in trouble now because the rain's not coming, right? Nope, go out again. He's just sitting there on the Mount Carmel with his his, uh, uh, head in his knees, and he's like, go out again, seven times. And it came to pass on the seventh time that he said, behold, if you look out there, there is a little cloud that's coming. I never have understood what the size, maybe somebody's heard this explained or you know what it means, but I've never been able to understand what it says. It's the size of a, uh, uh, it's like a man's hand. I don't know if that just means the shape of it. You know, I've heard people say like, that means it was small. Wow. How close is the man's hand? I don't know <laughs> how small it is. If it's close, then it's a big cloud. You know, if it's, I don't understand that. I think maybe it was just shaped like a hand or something like that. I don't know how big it was, but this guy's saying, oh, there's a cloud. You know, whoa, that's not. That's not like this huge storm, you know, dark clouds and lightning and thunder, you know. No, this is, uh, this is all he got. And he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and, uh, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab in the entrance of Jezreel. Now, I can't wait to get into chapter 19. Ahab goes and, and, uh, and, and pouts to his wife Jezebel. <laughs> right? But look, Elijah isn't actually the one that won the victory. We look at that sometimes and say, man, he won. You know, he, he won. He really showed them. No, God's the one that won that victory. Nothing Elijah did made sense. Nothing was his spectacular idea. It was what God told him to do. And he just followed and obeyed. Look at his prayer, just humbly, just God of Israel, Jacob, you know, uh, uh, just, just, you know, hey, let these people know that you're God. I'm just a servant. You know, you're, uh, you're the one that receives all the honor, honor and praise. I'm just doing what you told me to do. And that's what he did. And as a result, God was glorified in a mighty way. <clears throat> Now, Jesus said this in Matthew 21, verse 22. The last point here, I'm I'm just for the sake of time, just going to summarize it real quickly. The last point was this, that the God of, uh, 
Uh, actually, there's two points. I'm just going to really super fast, okay? Number, uh, number, number four was this. The God of Elijah will bring men to their knees. Verse 39 and uh, verse 42, uh, we see this idea of the men coming to their knees. And Romans 14, 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. In the end, I don't care if we're talking about after this life, if we're talking about you know, in the resurrection or, or, I mean, at the great white throne or whatever, our God, the God, the God of, of Elijah and our God, one day people will bow down before him and every knee will, uh, will bow. And then the last point was this, but the God of Elijah requires us to be faithful. Okay, Hebrews 11, 6 said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He wants us to be faithful. And I don't mean faithful. A lot of times we use faithful just meaning like loyal. Right, and that works. That's a that's an attribute that we need to have. But faithful just means this: full of faith. Right, people that have faith is required. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. First Corinthians four two. <clears throat> All right, so uh, he had to have faith. He had to go up there and say, God said He's bringing rain. He's going to bring rain. God said He's going to bring fire down upon this altar. He's going to bring fire upon this altar. And the man of God just has to submit himself to that and trust God and put his faith in me. The man of God needs to be faithful. Obedience, sticking with simplicity of what God's told us to do and not trying to complicate it, and then continuing in faith even when the results don't seem visible. <clears throat> That's what God, the God of Elijah, wants us to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the simplicity of it. And uh, help us not complicate it, but help us be very uh faithful in, in knowing that you're going to do it, uh, what you've promised to do, if we'll just go out and be faithful to, uh, to doing uh, our part, which is by faith, just, just carrying that out and not worrying about impressing anybody, not worrying about coming up with the greatest plan or the greatest idea about reaching folks and, and building up a huge empire or something like that. Lord, we do want to see the grow, the the work uh, grow, and uh, and great things done. But we want it to be for your honor and glory. And uh, if you aren't going to receive the honor and glory, if we're going to magnify ourselves and and uh, end up trying to steal the glory from you, then I pray that this work would never grow, and that good wouldn't come out of it. But if you can be glorified by what we do, I pray that you'd bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.